Now, that's a good point because the, sur the actual surgery happens at most a few hours after hours. It's never like the patient goes home with this wire and has a surgery some other time. We have to schedule it so it's the same yeah. day. So that's for logistics, obviously, because. All right, and people start showing up. You open the doors and they come for you, Dr. Tiffany Chan. Welcome to eShadowing. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Sorry, everyone, for starting a few minutes late, just getting started here, but we're going to have so much fun. Dr. Tiffany Chan, you are a breast radiologist and the uh, fellowship director at that. So I'm excited to learn about breast radiology, the, the path to becoming a breast radiologist, and all of that fun stuff to see if maybe we can get some uh, future radiology nerds uh, <laughs> down that journey today. So yes, love um, <laughs> as you are joining us, as, as uh, you come in here today, let us know where you are watching from and let us know if radiology is potentially a field you are interested in and interested in and why. I would love to know. And make sure you change that chat to everyone instead of just hosts and panelists. Uh, Dr. Chan, I know you have um, a slides show for us. So why don't we jump in? We'll jump yes. into that. And then hopefully have some time for some Q&A. And um, for those of you watching, feel free to ask questions. Uh, I'm monitoring the chat and the Q&A. So, so uh, I'll keep Let asking. me get that started. Give me one second here. Detroit, Ohio, Atlanta, San Francisco, Denver. Hello, Kirsten. Coming Georgia. From Spain, Justin hanging out all the way in España. Hello, hello. All right. So I see your screen. All right. Video. We can get started if you guys want. All right. You're able to see my screen, right? Yep. Okay, everyone. So I just want to chat with you guys a little bit today about what it's like being a radiologist. Specifically, I am an academic breast radiologist, and I'll kind of go into what that means. A sec here. So I have a few goals for you today. I'm going okay, to share hold on, with hold you. Hold on one second. You're sharing the wrong screen. Let's I see, see. I see your web browser, not your PowerPoint. Okay, hold on. What about... There we go. Oh, hold on. That went away. <laughs> I'm at like this like office where I have multiple screens, so it can be kind yep. of confusing here. Give me one second. So I want to share this one, my screen too. All right. And then, okay. How about that? Mm, it's not sharing yet. You had it for, I had it for a sec though, right? For a second, yeah. Come back, come back. I'm coming back. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Nothing shared right now. Nothing is shared right now. Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. <laughs> my gosh, my gosh. There we go. Yes. Okay, so this Wait. is, now you're seeing the e-shadowing thing, right? I'm seeing the website, yep. Okay. What about now? Still the website. Still the website. What is going on here? Share this. And now? There we go. Okay, we're back in business. All right, so today I wanted to share a little bit with you guys about what I do, um, a little bit about me and the kind of the journey that I took to get to where I am. And I want to give you a background in radiology as well, too, because it's an awesome field. I want to show you a typical day in my life and give you an introduction to some of the different types of imaging that we deal with. And lastly, I'll give you some examples of some cases that I see, including the disease processes and the procedures that I do. All right. So I am currently um, an attending physician on faculty at UCLA, which is obviously an academic hospital. I'm a board certified radiologist and my specialty is in breast imaging. I'm finishing up my fourth year as an attending and I was actually honored to be selected as the fellowship director of breast uh, this past year. In the pink here, you can see my journey to becoming a radiologist with this specialty. I'm probably one of the less common people to just have gone through everything without taking any time off 
um, or doing any special programs. And I was actually really surprised about this because I thought going into med school that most people just went straight through. You go to college, you go to med school, that's it. But actually, you know, most of my med school friends and classmates had some career experience outside of medicine. And they came into med school feeling pretty confident about their commitment. Um, I was also lucky because I got to med school the first time and sometimes not everybody does. Um, and if you don't, you always can take a year off or whatever many years to boost your resume and try again. Um, one thing I'd like to point out too is that as part of radiology, you do have to do an intern year. It can be in medicine, it can be in surgery, it can be something called a transitional year where you kind of do a mix of both. I happen to always love procedures and uh, surgery. So I chose to do a surgery year uh, where exactly I did medical school. And that actually helped my technical skills and my overall efficiency um, when dealing with patient care. So what exactly is radiology? So this is a pretty awesome field that almost every other specialty depends on, from primary care to neurosurgery. Almost all doctors rely on medical imaging to help them make decisions uh, for their patients. And you know, it's funny because we're not really covered on a lot of medical shows. And when we are, it's basically, a, it's usually a non-radiologist who's holding like a picture upside down. Um, and so while many physicians are okay at reading their own specialties imaging, like an orthopedic surgeon, reading knee MRIs, it's still always the radiologist's responsibility to kind of know more than them and to pick up on the most subtle or unusual findings. So radiology is basically reframing everything that you learn in medical school in the form of pictures. So these pictures can include x-rays, MRI, CT, PET scans, angiograms, mammograms, the list goes on and on. And at the end of the day, the best part is that the pictures really present the truth about what's happening inside a patient. And when medical technology advances, so does radiology. A lot of our older radiologists may have been trained only on X-ray and ultrasounds, which are the more old school techniques, but now there's CT, there's MRI and much more. So we're actually always at the forefront of new technology. And by the way, there are many specialties within radiology. And if you are resident in radiology, you rotate through all of them. So here is a list of these different specialties and some common studies that you may have heard of. Most people do end up doing a fellowship in one of these. Um, IR or interventional is kind of the exception because it used to be a fellowship and now has its own integrated pathway. So there's some myths about being a radiologist that you may have heard, and I definitely want to talk about that. Um, some people might think that radiologists aren't like real doctors because we're not running down a hallway shouting clear like you see on the shows. <laughs> Um, but ironically, we are the only group in medicine that are considered the doctor's doctor. That means physicians consult us for our medical opinions on their patient's imaging. Depending on our specialty too, we can also see our own patients just like in my specialty. So we are a patient's physician as well too. And because we don't do rounds with the clinical teams, some may forget that we actually are a very big part of it. So during my training, we would take call in the emergency room. And when a trauma came in, let's say a car accident, we actually had to run to the CT scanner and we would read a head to toe CT in front of the emergency room doctors and sometimes the trauma surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, et cetera. And we'd be saying, hey, like there's a vertebral body fracture here, a kidney laceration there. So these are all things that need to be taken care of, but no one can really see from the outside, right? And so there's also this funny myth that we don't like to socialize. Part of the lifestyle aspect in radiology is that we generally have pretty good hours. So we have time to leave the hospital and go socialize. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody thinks this, but radiology is probably the opposite of easy. You have to memorize and understand head to toe anatomy and how different disease processes appear. Um, we have to read the imaging better than anyone else. And our boards are actually one of the toughest. When I took it, it was about two days and 16 hours. I think it might be broken up into three days now. <laughs> So this oh, is kids these days, they're so soft. You got to stretch it out. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about how to get into radiology, you know, this changes pretty much every year, um, especially now I know that the step one uh, exam has been changed. But essentially, you know, in the past, it's there's been some things that make an applicant successful. Obviously, your scores, uh, about 20% of successful applicants are AOA members. People are very involved in abstracts, presentations, publications. Um, obviously, there's all these different things that help you get the interview. And then for the actual ranking um, for getting into this residency, we really still value interactions, interpersonal skills, and that sort of thing. I also wanted to chat a little bit about kind of our lifestyle. So perhaps you may have heard of like the road to success. This is traditionally um, the four specialties that offer great compensation and lifestyle. So overall work-life balance. 
So I would have to say that radiologists are generally happy and compensated well. Now, this by no means should be the driving force behind going into radiology, because at the end of the day, if you hate what you do, no amount of money is going to make you happy at work, right? But that being said, compensation was never really discussed with me when I was in med school or with any of my classmates. And I know now, as somebody who is paying back her loans, it's actually very important. All of my friends who are young attendees all agree with this. But just so you know, radiologists are on the higher end of income earners in medicine. We generally feel fairly compensated. And most of us would choose the same specialty if given the choice. So of course we express, we experience burnout, but in the long run, we tend to do well. All right, let's shift gears here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about a typical day for me. So breast imaging is a specialized field of radiology that's dedicated to the diagnosis and management of breast pathologies. We use mammogram, which is a type of X-ray, ultrasound and MRI for evaluation. We actually also perform interventional procedures under imaging guidance focused on the breast. So why did I choose breast imaging? Well, I actually feel very fulfilled seeing patients and my ideal job is a mix of using imaging to help patients. I love procedures, I love working with my hands. Maybe it's because I played video games before, so I needed a field where I could be doing this every day. And from anyone who is wondering from a practical standpoint, AI and outsourcing has less of a chance of affecting my job if I'm able to do procedures well. What exactly do we do? We work in our own clinics, which is different than other radiology fields. We do spend some time in a dark room. By the way, radiology rooms are dark because our eye can better see contrast and subtleties on imaging than if the room was very, very bright. It's not because you're vampires? It's not because we're vampires. I <laughs> promise, I promise. But sometimes when we go out of the room, it can be a little bit, a little bit bright for us. So that's about 30% of our day. The majority of my days actually spent talking to patients and discussing findings that we're seeing on their imaging. And the other 30% I'm spending doing image guided procedures. This includes biopsies, abscess drainages, cyst aspirations, and localizations, all of which I'll show you at the end of this presentation. This is kind of my average day that I have. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. Um, I'm generally up and about by eight doing biopsies, diagnostic studies. Um, I do have some time during lunch to have some meetings and catch up. And in the afternoon, I do more biopsies and diagnostic studies. Throughout the entire day, I'm reading screening mammograms, which I'll talk about, um, and also reading about one to two breast MRIs. If anybody is you know, interested in academics or private practice thinking long down the road, because I'm in academics, I also teach residents and fellows every day. I give lectures just like this one. I help design and improve the curriculum. I do conferences, publications, and as fellowship director, I'm also in charge of fellowship recruitment. What kind of patients do we see? So, you know, most of our patients are women, technically of all ages, generally about 14. I've seen 98 year old patients too, but perhaps you didn't know, we actually see a handful of male patients as well. We actually see about one to two, maybe a day, and men come to us with breast or chest lumps and pain, and they have their own pathologies that we see. Male breast cancer is not common. It only is about 1% of all breast cancers, but we obviously want to diagnose all of those. They can also get lymphoma. And more importantly, they can get something called gynecomastia, which is benign breast tissue and other benign findings like lipomas. So what exactly do we do in our clinic? We technically divide our patients up into three categories, diagnostic, screening, and procedure. So let's talk about diagnostic first. These are patients that have a specific issue. So whether it's a symptom that you're presenting with, let's say a follow-up of a previously evaluated problem or a callback from screen. So that's when somebody has undergone screening, there's something abnormal on their study and we need additional pictures to evaluate. Essentially all of our diagnostic patients are getting some sort of additional imaging, whether it's mammogram, ultrasound or both, and that depends on a patient's age and finding. We then decide on the management, which can be, hey, everything looks good, come back to us in a year for your next screening exam, or hey, I'm a little bit worried about this lesion, let's schedule you for a biopsy with us. Sometimes we might recommend an MRI too. So that's when we go and we discuss all these findings and recommendations with the patient. It can be a difficult conversation, honestly. The other part of this picture, of course, is the screening aspect. These are for asymptomatic patients. These patients see only our radiology technologists who take the images and upload it for us to evaluate the next day. So we usually don't see these patients the same day unless there's something that's truly, truly abnormal. At this point, you might be wondering what some breath pathologies even are. 
And chances are you've heard of breast cancer and maybe cysts and not really much else. So this is just a very, very brief overview of all the things that we deal with. Of course, we can't go into each and every one, but just to show you an idea of the things we see. Um, a few things that I think that everybody should know. Um, no one can tell if a mass is benign or malignant just based on physical exams. So something that is mobile or squishy or not squishy, those are not super useful adjectives. It doesn't replace uh, the need for imaging. IDC or invasive ductal carcinoma is the most common type of breast cancer. It's breast cancer in the ducts. DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, means that it's in the ducts, hasn't broken out yet, but we do consider it to be a breast cancer. Um, and last thing, the most common cancer in the breast is primary breast cancer, meaning it starts in the breast. But you can get METs or metastatic disease uh, to the breast, most commonly from the other side. Um, the most common non-breast metastasis is melanoma or lymphoma. Okay, so I can't give a general breast radiology talk, but I'll talk about screening and mammogram for just a little bit. So let's talk about the current guidelines, and I'll tell you a little bit about what happens to a patient after they've had a screening mammogram as well, too. So you might have seen uh, some different guidelines in the news, but we generally go by ACR or American College of Radiology guidelines because we're the radiologists and we're the ones who see the cancers. The general premise behind every screening exam is the same. We want to catch cancers in their early stages to prevent morbidity, mortality, and healthcare costs. If a cancer is advanced enough that you can feel it, we obviously are still going to take care of it but we ideally wanna find it when it's small. So therefore, for the regular asymptomatic women in the US with average breast cancer risk, we recommend yearly mammograms 40 and above. There's actually no end age because it kind of depends on the person's other health issues. I've seen very healthy 88 year olds who would definitely benefit from screening mammograms. Here are some other statements from varying, you know, other screening recommendations, other organizations such as American Cancer Society, um, and now the problem with delaying mammograms until even 45 or 50 is that you're missing a lot of cancers that present uh, in their 40s. I talked a little bit about average risk. So what is average versus high risk? High risk, you know, means that um, you have a greater than 20% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. There's a bunch of different models that you just plug in your information that will tell you what your lifetime risk is. If you're high risk, things are a little bit different. We're going to recommend a yearly mammogram starting at 30 and also MRI starting at 25 to 30. And if you're in either of these other groups, you actually should have your risk evaluated uh, by age 30. When you go to a screening mammogram, what happens after that? So out of 100 people who get a screening mammogram, 90 will actually be told that their mammograms are normal, so like 90% of them. 10, 10% will be called back, meaning we're gonna ask you to come back for more pictures. And out of those, six will still be told that their mammograms are normal. And that's because a lot of the findings that we see can actually just be normal tissue overlapping each other or something that's just a false positive from the start. After that, two of those will be asked to return for a follow-up exam, and only two, two people out of the hundred, will be recommended to have a biopsy. Okay, so before we go on, let's talk a little bit about the imaging modalities. We use three different types. We use mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI uh, for the breast, and these are the staples for looking at soft tissue. So x-rays um, are the oldest and most commonly used form of medical imaging. They allow us to see inside the body at the cost of a tiny, tiny amount of radiation. And each screening mammogram has standard views that we get. There's two views called the CC view, craniocaudal, meaning like from head to toe, um, or the MLO. The MLO is medial lateral oblique, which is another type of uh, position. So what a, this is what a mammogram machine looks like. In this setup, uh, which is for the craniocaudal view, X-rays are go, go from the tube up top, through the breast, and onto that black surface, that detector. So to understand what a mammogram looks like, I added some cartoons here. Um, so this is the CC view with the breast that is uh, compressed. And the easiest way to kind of visualize what's happening here is to think about looking down at your feet. So for the picture on the left, which is marked with an R, think about yourself looking down the right side of your body, okay? And that's how you get your CC picture. Here's some basic anatomy, some things that we're seeing on these pictures. So the lateral aspects of your breast are illustrated here. That's gonna be where your arms are, all right? That's the blue that's labeled here. The medial aspects are at the bottom of the image. That's where your sternum is. And of course, your nipple is right in the middle. So by the way, your breast is made of two things. It's made of fat and tissue. So fat is gonna appear dark gray or black and tissue is gonna appear white. And the amount of fat that's relative to that tissue is something called density, which I'm sure you guys have heard about and I'll go into. 
For now, just understand that the tissue is white and cancer comes from tissue, not fat. So when cancer is present, it's going to appear white. There are things that show up in the breast that are black or dark gray. That's gonna be fat or other fat-like things like lipomas. Okay, let's take a look at this other view. So this is the MLO view. And as you can tell, this view gives us a little bit more breast tissue than on the CC. And it kind of can be a little bit easier to understand as well too. Let's look at this diagram here. So superior means up top, inferior means bottom. So you can kind of tell here your head is going to be at the top of the picture, your feet will be at the bottom. Um, this white line that's in the back of both of these pictures, that's actually your pec muscles. And those little uh, circles that you can kind of see in the back that are axillary lymph nodes. So we can actually see some of the lymph nodes that are in your underarm area. That can be sometimes the first sign of a breast cancer or of a lymphoma. So let's talk about breast tissue density. So clinically speaking, by the way, there's no way you can tell if you or your patient has dense breasts. And so we as radiologists know this because number one, we came up with this classification system. And number two, we get patients that come to us every day that say, hey, I've been told by my primary care doctor, I got dense breasts, I got fatty breasts, but they get a mammogram and they definitely do not. So regardless, all you need to know is that density is a mammographic finding. It's the ratio between white and black on your mammogram. The vast majority of patients in the general population, okay, have breast tissue density in the middle. And by the way, density has nothing to do with size, probably has more to do with genetics. And there's also some other factors that can increase or decrease your density as well too. Most people start off life a little bit denser, meaning in the younger ages, and then their breast gets replaced with fat throughout the year and as you get older. So that's part of the reason why we don't do mammograms on very young patients, because you just can't see that much anyways. Um, and there's also the radiation aspect of it too. Also, if you're someone on hormone replacement or who is breastfeeding, that's gonna increase your density. And one interesting thing I think is that if you gain weight, that actually decreases your density because you're essentially gaining fat. So if you're someone who gains fat in their breast, your density, that ratio is gonna start flipping. So that is another way you can change your density. So why does density even matter? So as I said before, cancer comes from tissue, not fat. So when it's present, it's white. So in a dense breast that's mostly tissue, it can be hard to find a small white abnormality in the background. So let's look at this as an example. This picture all the way to the left is someone with a fairly fatty breast, right? You can see more gray than there is white. If I'm looking for something that is abnormally white on a mammogram, it'll probably stand out, right? Like this little bunny here. <laughs> Someone who is a little bit denser, this picture in the middle, this is the same person from the middle to the right. It's going to be a little bit harder for me to find that, right? And you can actually see it. I pointed it out here, but it's so much harder to see. So it's an issue of detection, as well as the fact that people with denser breasts actually have a higher risk of developing breast cancer um, innately. So we talked a lot about mammogram. What about ultrasound? So ultrasound is one of those old school modalities. It's been around forever. The best part is it has no radiation. It's very useful for soft tissue anywhere in the body. Obviously, we don't do it just for breasts. We do it for the belly. We do it for other things too. So the cons is that it's operator dependent um, and it can be limited by things like air or calcifications. But in our world, ultrasound is really useful for the breast. And it's the first imaging study that we use for women under 30 that are presenting with breast pain or breast lumps. Okay. And all this evidence, by the way, is from something called the ACR, American College of Radiology Appropriateness Criteria. So all physicians, radiologists or not, use these guidelines to determine what imaging test is best for their clinical question. And there's a rating. There's a rating from one to nine, with nine being the most appropriate study. So this link is actually here, and it's for everything, not just for breast, but for anything from chest pain, vaginal bleeding, everything. There's an ACR of appropriateness criteria for every single thing. So when I talk about breast ultrasound, it can be a little confusing as to how we're positioning this patient. So I'm going to have Pusheen help us here. In our field, we scan the patient in the supine position. So supine means kind of like this. I remember supine meaning like you're holding a cup Hold of the soup, soup in your hand. <laughs> right, exactly. Hold the cup of soup in your hand and then prone is the other one. Prone is the other one where you're lying on your belly. So when I show you this picture, you can kind of orient yourself um, by thinking that the top of the picture is where the front of the patient is, kind of like if you're lying on your back. OK, that's where the ultrasound probe is. And on the back of the patient is going to be your chest wall. And during the biopsies, actually, we stay away from this area because we don't want to gear, get near the chest wall, which is where the lungs are. Let's talk about breast MRI. Breast MRI is positioned in a different way. So you're actually not holding soup. You're positioned prone like this. 
with your breasts that are hanging through a window like in this cartoon. This actually helps extend the breast tissue. And this is different from if you were ever to get a CT where you would be supine. So who even needs a breast MR? It's probably a very specific sort of study, right? So this study is done for high-risk patients for silicone implant evals and for patients who actually have known cancers. They're going to go get surgery, but the surgeon wants to know the extent of disease. And it's also useful for patients who have cancer and surgery, and they just want to make sure that nothing is recurring. So let's go through just a few cases here. We're going to use everything that I just showed you. So case number one, this is a 56-year-old female, and she feels a right breast lump that's marked by a BB. That BB is that little white dot. It's made out of metal, so we can see it very bright on an x-ray, and it's circled in blue in the second picture here. I'm showing you a right mammogram, and there is a dense mass in her superior breast, the part of her breast that's closer to her head. And a targeted ultrasound of this mass actually shows an irregular mass when we put color flow on it, meaning when we look for blood flow, we can see that there is some vascularity, okay? So all of these things are fairly suspicious for cancer. Things that are cancer tend to recruit blood flow to it. That's how it grows so abnormally compared to the rest of your tissue. That's how these tumors end up becoming these huge ball where the rest of your tissue is just kind of staying the same. It's because they recruit blood flow, oxygen, and all the things it needs to grow. So biopsy was done with us and pathology came back as an invasive ductal carcinoma. Hmm. One thing that I do want to point out is when we talk about masses, a mass is a three-dimensional structure. It occupies space, but they're not always bad because things like cysts and benign things are also masses too with no malignancy potential, but they can be felt as masses and that are reason why patients come to see us. So by the way, we know that patients, we recommend that patients generally know how their breasts feel at baseline. But we don't have specific recommendations on self-breast exams anymore, but it, it, it varies honestly between practice. Um, we have found that a lot of the times these increase patient anxiety and false positives, but we do recommend that people know how things feel at baseline so that new bumps, lumps, or anything form that you'll know. Again, let's talk about how not all masses are bad. This is case number two. Can, I, can I go back to that other one yes. real quick? So that BB that you talked about, was that just a complete um, like luck that she felt something that actually wasn't the mass or was that the BB a, a symptom of the mass? So the BB is marking what she's feeling. The mass Correct. is right underneath it. So, okay. it so it's probably necessarily... pushing up something that was there before. Exactly, exactly. And you know what? It's not always exactly where it is, but this is a distance like close enough that makes me think what I found is matching what she's feeling. Okay. Yeah. Pretty, pretty close. Yeah. Okay. So if we're going to case number two, um, this is an 81 year old female. She was an anticoagulation, meaning that she was on something that makes her blood thinner because let's say she has a history of strokes. She clots very easily. We want to put on medication that makes her not clot as much. Okay. So she's on this medication. She comes to us with this left breast lump that she's feeling. It's that, that white circle that you're seeing on that mammogram here. So ultrasound is showing us more of what we call an anechoic and hypochoic appearance. These are all fancy ultrasound words. It just means that there's more black on ultrasound. Black on ultrasound, by the way, kind of means more fluid. And because this didn't look like an entirely solid mass, we gave her some numbing medication through a needle, like local lidocaine. We put a syringe and we actually take out that fluid. And lo and behold, look at that fluid. It's red, right? What is red in the body? It's a bloody liquid, and actually it was a hematoma. And this hematoma probably formed because she was on this medication that prevents her from clotting, which is good from a stroke perspective, but bad from a perspective that if she ever was to, let's say, have a minor fall or run into something, let's say when she's opened up her car door, which are all things I've heard of, um, these micro traumas, she's te she tends to bleed a little bit more quickly. And so this is basically a ball of blood that has formed in her breast. Sometimes this trauma can be what we call a micro trauma, meaning she may not even remember it. Most importantly, it's something that she felt and is not a cancer. All right, so let's talk about case three. This is a 29-year-old female coming in with a left breast lump. The imaging study that she should get is going to be an ultrasound because she's under 30, remember? So we do an ultrasound right over the lump and this is what we see. We see this kind of oval mass that correlates with what she's feeling. So what is this? And this is actually a trick question because this is actually a rib. And it's actually a common cause of what people feel in their breasts, okay? People think they may be feeling a lump. It's very scary. 
And this is one of our better news when we can tell the patient, hey, your breast tissue actually looks completely fine. You're just on the thinner side and what you're feeling is your underlying rib. So if you look at the annotations here, your skin that's at the top of the picture, it's really, really skinny. Your breast tissue is gonna be in the blue asterisk. And that exactly is the area that we look for masses, cysts, anything breast related. Just as it's important for us to know what's abnormal, we have to know what's normal too, right? Because we can't panic about everything. We need to know when to work things up. In this case, we need to know where the pec muscle is. That's in the purple. That's that muscle that's draped over in the entire study. And then your rib is in the pink. Underneath that or close to the patient's back is gonna be the lungs. And that's gonna be in the yellow asterisk. That's where we stay away. Um, when we put in needles to do biopsies, we don't wanna cause what we call a pneumothorax or a collapsed lung. One other thing that we can talk about too are calcifications in case anybody's ever heard of this. It's kind of a weird uh, thing to think about, but they're actually very, very common. Um, the biggest difference between these and calcifications elsewhere in the body is that they can be associated with cancer sometimes in the breast. Now, they can be good or they can be bad, and we determine that based on their shape and their distribution on mammogram. Sometimes we see them, they look 100% benign. We don't even need to follow them. Others are very suspicious for cancer and they need to be biopsied. So let me give you some examples here. So this is a 65 year old female. She's coming in for screening mammogram. She's got all these crazy zigzag bright white lines all over the place. So what are these things? These are actually vascular calcifications. They are curvilinear. They kind of follow the form of a vessel. They have what we call a tram track appearance like this, meaning they have things on both sides because they're lining the walls of the vessels. They're kind of like double lines. This is a benign finding. Um, in someone at 65, I am not surprised that she has developed these sort of calcifications. Now, in someone that is younger, let's say that she was 41, I wouldn't necessarily think she should be developing these calcifications unless she's got something else that's going on. Let's say that she has you know, type 1 diabetes or she has renal failure, something else that's chronic. So sometimes a mammogram can be one of the first things that signals uh, a more systemic problem, okay? Let's talk about these sort of calcifications. Now, this is on a screening mammogram in a 50-year-old. These look a little bit different than those tubes that I was showing you before, right? And calcifications are one of the hardest things that we have to deal with. It takes a lot of practice, but hopefully you can tell that the shape of these do not look like the ones from before. So these are very suspicious. They're called fine linear branching. What it means is that they're filling up little ducts inside your breast, and that's where cancers grow. So whenever we see this, we always want to do a biopsy. This lady ended up getting a biopsy and it turned out to be a cancer, came back as DCIS. Okay. All right, so I am coming from LA. Let's talk about breast implants. We see these all the time, <laughs> all right? No, um, so <laughs> not LA. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, so this is one great question we always get. You know, I have implants. Should I still be getting mammograms? So there are actually two general types of breast implants. They're silicone and they're saline, right? So many patients with implants think that if they have implants, they can't get them because they're going to get ruptured. They're going to, they're going to break open. So nothing can really be farther from the truth. We see patients with implants all the time for both screening and for diagnostic exams. Um, our techs actually have special methods to displace the implants. So as you can see, see here, this is the same person, same breast. This is wow. a regular mammogram with the implant and then one with the implant kind of pushed away out of the picture which is important because people with implants obviously can still develop bad things in their remaining breast tissue, okay? Now, implants might make it a little bit harder to do biopsies. We never want to rupture an implant during one of our biopsies, but that's why we use imaging to help us. This, by the way, is one, one of the larger implants um, that if you ever have never seen one in real life, this is a 760 cc uh, saline implant. That's, so That's big. <laughs> it's, it's a big one, it's a big one. Um, and with implants, you know, the concern is always, you know, if they have ruptured and patients will go to their primary care doctors, their OBGYNs, whoever, they'll say they have a lot of breast pain, they're worried about implant rupture. So let me tell you just a few quick facts about these. If you have saline implants, meaning like kind of like water implants, you will know that your implant has ruptured based on just the physical exam because one side will be flat. You actually don't need imaging to tell you this. This patient has a ruptured saline implant and she knew it. She just kept it in didn't really care about it. This was her regular screening mammogram. Um, the saline leaks out, it gets resorbed by the body, no problems at all. Silicone implants are a different story. When they rupture, um, you might not actually know that it has ruptured because silicone is a little bit more viscous. So when it leaks out, it's still able to kind of hold up this overall structure pretty well. And you might have a normal physical exam. 
Um, and there are cases, you know, where they're sent to us for imaging evaluation. And the gold standard really is breast MRI to see if there had been ruptured. And sometimes that silicone can be taken up by lymph nodes in your underarm area. So sometimes we'll see silicone there as well too. Um, let's talk a little bit about image guided procedures. I think this is the last chapter here. So this is my favorite part. Um, just so you guys know, we do these procedures in our office. They all involve local lidocaine. There's no general anesthesia or sedation. So I like telling my patients that they're undergoing a procedure, not a surgery. They technically can drive themselves. They should definitely eat you know, before the procedure. They're going to be with it during the entire time and they're gonna be comfortable during the procedure. So the main things that we do are gonna be biopsies and localizations. And here's a tray of all the different things that we use. The goal of a biopsy is to obtain a small sample of tissue. This is sent to another doctor, a pathologist, and then we get the results in a few days. They have to look at it under a microscope and look at the cells, do some special stains. Another procedure we do is called a localization. That's kind of us pinpointing a cancer for a lumpectomy. That's where a surgeon is trying to take out a small amount of tissue, the least amount of tissue that's bad, but all of the cancer that they can. Both of these procedures can be done under mammogram, ultrasound, or MRI, depending on how we best see a finding. We also do some other procedures, and I'll show you some pictures too, of an abscess drainage and a cyst aspiration. So this is a case of an abscess. This is a 26-year-old um, who came in with a left nipple ring, and she had under her nipple, a, well, she felt that there was something underneath her nipple, and that whole area was really red and inflamed. Things were not you know, responding to antibiotics. And she wanted to see basically if she has just, just a skin infection, which is called cellulitis, or if she has an infected pocket of fluid underneath called an abscess. Um, if so, we would want to know how big this fluid collection is and if I can remove that fluid. So at a certain point, the way I think about it is that the body can wall off an infection and treat it. Antibiotics will definitely kill the bacteria, but at a certain size, the body can only do so much. And that pocket of fluid can actually get super infected and can really, really cause problems. It can elevate your white count. It can cause fevers. It can be systemic if it's not treated. So what we usually do in this case, we give some lidocaine, we put a needle into the pocket and we take out some of that fluid. So let me kind of show you some pictures here. This is an ultrasound. I know it looks very blurry, but essentially to the right is that pocket of fluid. That bright white line you've seen, that is actually the needle that we use to go right into that area. This is of course, after she's been numbed with that lidocaine, all right? So this is that needle, this is the abscess. What does it look like? This is all the stuff that we took out of that pocket. There's some red in there because there is some bleeding, of course, but that thick white fluid is what we call purulent fluid, and that's infection. We can always send this off to the lab so that they can tell us exactly what kind of bacteria is there. And then the primary care doctor actually can really tailor their antibiotics. So you're really like attacking like this specific type of bacteria, which you obviously don't really know unless you have this sample. You would probably put people on a general type of antibiotic, but not something super, super specific. And it's cool too, because the patient can feel that day that that area has gone down. It used to be a bump. We take out the fluid, now it's nice and flat. So it's a very gratifying procedure for everyone. All right, one of our last cases here, this is gonna be that localization that I was telling you about. So essentially, these are for patients that are known to have cancer, okay? So a mastectomy means that a surgeon is gonna remove the entire breast. They don't really need us for this. This used to be the more common way of dealing with cancers. And more recently, you know, over many, many years, we've developed something called a lumpectomy where the surgeon removes only the cancer but they kind of need guidance on exactly where that spot is, right? It needs to be very, very exact. So what they do is that we have patients come to us the morning of, let's say this is a patient with a known cancer right in this little box area. So what I do is I give numbing medication and I put a needle right down to that wire. So that area is going right into that specific area on mammogram. The patient leaves from our office with a wire sticking out of her breast and she goes down to the operating room. The surgeon then uses that wire to get to exactly where she needs to go and take out that tissue. Then the surgical specimen, the piece that they cut out, is actually sent to us to evaluate again while the patient's still in the operating room. We take an x-ray of that specimen, and I'll show you what that looks like, and we make sure that they got the cancer that, that was needed. Okay, it's actually really, really cool. Let me show you what it looks like in real life. On the left is an example of that, another example of one of those needles. This one has like a little hook like this. The rainbow color looking thing, that is actually the real life gross specimen that was sent to us from the operating room. It's dyed in different colors. 
it's tie dye. It, it's actually not tie dye inside, which would have been really cool, I think. Um, but they, what they do is they put different dyes to kind of show. All right, so the blue is going to mark like the, where the uh, specimen was oriented in the patient. So let's say that we want to make sure that the blue part is actually near the head, the orange part is near like the the outside. That way, if they are too close to one side or another, I can tell them, hey, surgeon, okay. I think that the cancer is kind of closer to the head. We might want to take a few more samples there. And that way, the patient gets all the care that they need to get before they leave the operating room. So it's pretty cool. Anyways, that is, I think, all the things that I pretty much do. I just want to give you guys a quick overview. Hopefully, that was useful. And I'm happy to take any questions that you guys might have. Dr. Chanimal. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, Kirsten asks, is any further treatment required for the patient with the hematoma? What goes on there? Not necessarily. So, I mean, I think we can do probably a follow-up ultrasound, maybe in about one or two weeks or so. Um, and that's really at the discretion of the primary mm -hmm. care doctor. At that point, when a hematoma has formed, um, it's basically not going to grow anymore. One thing that we actually look at during our evaluation is to make sure there's not active blood flow going into the hematoma, meaning is it still bleeding? When we look at it and we make sure nothing's still bleeding, I can be pretty confident it's not going to re-bleed, okay? Unless the patient comes back to me and says, hey, this bump that was here, you took out that blood, it went down, I went home for a week and it came back. So then obviously I'm going to rescan and potentially take out more fluid. But my suspicion for that is gonna be lower because she has already come to me and demonstrated that she's not actively bleeding. So yeah. for her, she would not need any specific um, treatment for this hematoma. Yeah. Um, a interesting question here from Jamal. So going back to where you place the guide wire, mm -hmm. is there a risk of infection since the patient is leaving your room, your, your clinic, and going down to the OR? I'm assuming there's always a small risk because it's a procedure. You're breaking yeah. the skin. No, it's a great question. We do everything under sterile guidance. So our needles, our, you know, the wire itself, obviously, our gloves, everything is sterile. So we do a whole sterile procedure with us here. Now, that's a good point because the, sur the actual surgery happens at most a few hours after hours. It's never like the patient goes home with this wire and has a surgery some other time. We have to schedule it so it's the same yeah. day. So that's for logistics, obviously, because we don't want patients running around with wires, okay? Nobody wants that. And also for things like infection, it reduces the chances because they're not going anywhere. They're just staying in the hospital, usually at an outpatient center. So it, the yeah. risk for infection is fairly fairly low because it's just so fast between putting the wire in and getting that wire taken out. Yeah. You had mentioned earlier in some of the slides that goes to a question from Elizabeth here, you had talked about how radiologists, you, you, need to lo you need to know a lot and it's generally considered um, a specialty that, that physicians like and you're well compensated. Talk about the, in general, obviously you can't speak for every breast radiologist out there, but in general, work-life balance, what does that look like if you believe in such a thing? <laughs> I think it's very important. And I think it's something that I didn't really think about uh, when I went into medical school. Um, certainly not something that I, I considered much when I joined radiology. Um, I joined radiology because I thought it was intellectually fascinating and I liked the procedures that were there, but I didn't join it because I liked nice hours and, you know, getting paid, you know, yeah. that's obviously a perk that I now obviously consider many years uh, after this whole process. And as I see myself continuing in this career, it's something that is taking more and more importance every single day. Yeah. I would say in general, radiologists are, are very happy, especially breast radiologists where we are able to kind of combine what we see on imaging with an actual person. So that whole aspect of going into medicine because you watched House or Scrubs or something where you get to see patients and get that true um, you know, person to person connection, we still have that. And the best part is that we also have imaging which gives us the truth no matter what. If somebody is having pain, I can tell you if there is a reason for that pain and if so, what that is and how we can fix it. I get a black and white sort of approach to medicine, and I also get the humanistic approach to medicine. So for me, that's a big fulfillment that I really enjoy. Yeah. Also in my field, I feel like there's a lot of good continuity, meaning that if I see something on a screening mammogram for someone, chances are if that person comes back to my office or is seen by my colleagues, I will get some closure as to whether that was a true finding, if it was a cancer, if we send that person to surgery, you know, these are all kind of like a story for each patient. And for me, I think that's really great because it really feels like I'm making a difference. All those yeah. things are great in work-life balance. 
I would say that for our call, I do take breast call. That's an important thing to know. Um, but I split it with like 17 other faculty. It all varies based on practice. If you join a practice with three people, you'll be splitting it with three people. Um, but our main emergencies are going to be that thing I showed you, the breast abscess. Other things like cancers, although they are things that we want to address as soon as possible, they are not things that we need to get up at 2 a.m. in the morning for. So call is a big part of our work-life balance as well. And I would have to say that we have very good call as well. Yeah. Richard's asking a question that I was going to ask next. Um, I, I don't know how much you have been paying attention to uh, artificial intelligence and specifically recently the language learning models have just exploded yes. onto the scene in the last two months with chat GPT. If anyone's familiar with that, Google and other companies have been trying to use AI and machine learning and image processing for radiology and pathology. The fear mongers out there will say, we won't need radiologists in three years. And they've been saying that I think probably for 20 years. Yes. Um, where are we with that, right? I, I'm sure UCLA is big medical academic center in California where all the tech giants are. Oh yes, oh yes. Are, are you guys playing with that kind of stuff? How do you well, see I'll tell fitting you, in? I'll tell you that, you know, for, this is not super new to uh, breast imaging. So we have pretty much in all of our um, imaging systems, we have like a, a, what is it called? It's called computer aided detection. So yep. it's a built-in program um, on our mammograms. And basically what it does is that it looks for areas of interest. The computer looks for areas of interest and it will circle it with like a little yellow line. Yeah. Um, so we can read our mammogram, let's say without this feature, then we can press a button and then we can uh, involve this program. So the funny thing is, is that if you ask any breast radiologist who actually reads these studies, this detection is, is just not reliable. It picks up a lot of false positives. So a lot of things that we can tell just based on our experience is just normal tissue, normal calcifications, things that don't need workup. There'll be a circle there. There are times that there are truly abnormal findings that are not circled. So it's not reliable enough. Yeah. I do think that the detection part of it is very useful in patients, let's say, with less dense breasts, let's say fatty or you know at the, the lower end of the spectrum in terms of density. Because AI can probably help us get through those studies faster, like the really true stone cold normal studies, the ones that are not making us, you know, scratch our heads and like really think about it. The cases that are most stone cold normal, normal, I think they can probably let us spend less time on those so we can focus more of our attention and our experience on the tougher cases. The ones with patients that have had multiple surgeries or recurrences have extremely dense breast tissue. I think that's one way it can help us. Um, there's certainly a lot of things happening with AI, but so far I've not seen too much that's going to necessarily replace us. I yeah. hope if anything, it helps us. So I don't helps think us, it's something yeah. that we should hide from or run away from, but it can certainly help us <laughs> uh, in, in our profession. Yeah. And we have enough data, potentially the, the computer aided um, part of it is you mentioned, right? There's a lot of false positives. So you're like, Hey, this is completely normal. Is there a potential that the computer is seeing something that in three years down the line actually turns into cancer or does the data right. not, not play out or we don't I, know yet? I, I don't necessarily know that yet. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, a lot of the things I see that are, let's say marked by this detection system um, are just, it's not going to be anything. Like okay. I just know. Yeah. Okay. Now I can't say that all of it's going to be like that, but there's yeah. always a balance too, between knowing when to intervene with something. Right. Yeah. I'm not saying that um, every time I read a mammogram, it's going to be normal forever. It's just going to be normal at that point. It might happen in next year. Cancer grows in that exact same area, but it's nothing that I would have worked up or done anything about previously, you know? So it's always an issue of wanting to intervene when it's necessary and not trying to biopsy everyone or cause anxiety. Otherwise, there's no point in medicine, right? If we're going to call everyone back and, and put yeah. needles in everything, then there's no point in medicine. Anyone can do that. Yeah, it's it's fun, right? And this is this is where science and technology it gets it gets fun. Like um for for that specific instance, right? Of of you look at something as a snapshot today. And you're like, oh, there's nothing there. And next year you're like, oh, there is something. And you scratch yeah. your head. Did I miss something? Whatever. Like, again, with potentially computer-aided um, 
uh, detection, is there a potential of seeing stuff much earlier? Maybe not so that we're biopsying and, and causing harm to a patient, right? Because because anytime we have a procedure, but in in five years, in ten years, as we get better and better and better with um, with chemotherapies and and very um, personalized chemotherapies. Mm -hmm. They were like, hey, we caught this that we probably wouldn't have normally caught for another three years. Good, good, good thing, because now you just go take this pill and, and you'll be done with this tiny little cancer that started to seed that's never going to show up now. Right. Like that's right. where it gets fun to, to be in this field and see what's coming. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway. Um, can you please elaborate on application of AI? That's what we just talked about. What made you choose diagnostic radiology over other specialties like interventional? I actually really liked interventional too. Those were the two that I was deciding uh, between during my first year in residency. And at the time that I was doing residency, you could still do interventional um, as a fellowship. It was kind of, it was still kind of like the main pathway um, for it. So. I decided pretty late actually between the two. I think that I, I like the continuity that I alluded to earlier um, for my patients because I just felt like I, I wanted to know more of their stories. And if I was gonna invest my time and look at your mammogram and call something abnormal, I want to make sure that you got the care that you needed. Or if it turned out to be nothing, it turned out to be something completely benign. I also want to know that too. I just have that kind of curious mind. Um, I wanna solve these mysteries. So that's something that I felt I could really do um, on breast. I think that obviously lifestyle is a part of it as well too. I don't think it would be wrong to compare an interventional radiology lifestyle to a breast one. Um, yeah. Breast, I think I was still, I felt like I was able to do so much for my patients and still have a lot of fulfillment while also having the kind of schedule that I also wanted as well. I also had a lot of really great mentors uh, in breast radiology. And that's something that I would recommend for everybody uh, to look in whenever you're deciding on whether you want to go into medicine, and if so, what field within medicine, um, look at your mentors, look at the senior attendings. When I looked at the senior attendings in breast radiology, I felt like they were very happy and balanced. They could still do stuff, let's say, with their family, their pets, their kids, whatever that they wanted to do. Um, they had a very good, well-balanced life. And these are people that have been doing this for years and years to come, right? So you can't really look at let's say the residents, the fellows, or even the young attendings um, in any of these specialties, because there's a lot of stresses innately that come with trainees. Every resident is gonna be miserable, you know? And that's that's okay because it's a finite time. It's yep. a finite time for you to learn a lot of information, right? That's the time that you are most growing as an, as an individual, but it is finite and everyone is pretty grumpy during that time. So you can't really look at them. You gotta look at the people that have been doing it for years. And if they're truly happy, um, and they, they value the same things that you do, then you should consider that as a field. And so that was another reason why I chose um, first radiology specifically. Yeah. Um, Kira asked a question, going back to benign breast tumors, if someone has a benign breast tumor removed, are they considered high risk potentially for cancer in the future? Or are they separate? Not necessarily. So, you know, we see a lot of patients with things like fibroadenomas or cysts. Um, and it's not like having a cyst, for instance, is going to increase your risk by any means. Um, there is some, there might be some more thinking involved from our end if somebody has a history of a lot of these benign breast masses and they come to see us, right, for, for screening or whatever. We can't be biased into thinking that every new mass they develop is going to be benign. So that's yeah. something that we all have to be very, um, you know, careful to think about because people with benign breast masses can still develop cancers. It yep. does affect, um, you know, our thinking when we have that sort of history, but it's not like, you know, if you, if you have a bunch of fibroadenomas that you necessarily are going to have a breast cancer one day, by no means. Yeah. Dr. Tiffany, Tiffany Chan, I will end here. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing your specialty of breast radiology. It was a great presentation, amazing cases, thank you, thank you. images, all of that fun stuff. Um, people can find you at Dr. Dot channel on instagram if i remember correctly that's right you got it awesome thank you uh dr chan we uh for those watching we're in the process of trying to get a paper together for um for pre-meds and the covid uh impact of covid on those pre-meds so stay tuned for that everyone watching that's right thank, thank you for having me so ryan much. yeah bye. thank you